I'd like to welcome everybody to um, ESE 353, the analysis of algorithms. Um, my name is Steven Spina. Uh, I'm the one that's going to be teaching the course. Um, and one thing I'll apologize for in advance is that we are I, I, we're trying to tape the lecture in a way that there will be the audio, the lecture notes, and some video uh, on a tape that I'm hoping we'll be able to put on the web, which will help you know people who aren't here and future generations. So um, let, let's be patient with this. Hopefully, we'll figure out how to make this work over the um, next couple of classes. But um, I'd like to start out by going through the syllabus. Um, I uh, the syllabus will, is, will be on the web if you're watching this on, on, on uh, in TV land. Um, but I passed them out so people can see them. My uh, syllabus slides I'm afraid to get to due to the uh, technology here. But um, anyway, I'm Steve Spina. I'm the one teaching this course. It should be CSE 373, AMS 373, the uh, introduction to the algorithms course. Um, some of you may be graduate students taking the course for proficiency. How many of you are, how many people are there like that? Okay, a couple. If you have particular concerns about your situation, come and talk to me. Um, the stuff I'm going to be talking about at first is on the two sheets that represent the syllabus for the course. Um, the, uh, I'm the instructor. It gives my contact information. Um, in particular, I, I encourage you to go to the course web page. Um, it, where I keep a lot of information. Ideally, there will hopefully be the audio and video for the, for the course uh, on the web page eventually. But certainly all my lecture notes and handouts and audio from previous semesters and things like that are there. So um, I encourage you to stop by there. Um, my office hours are going to be after class and by appointment. So if you want to see me, come by, after, catch me after class, and we will um, catch uh, I take it back. My, my, my after my other class. That means 11.15 in the morning to uh, 12.45. Um, any questions about that? Or just that you know anything like that? Okay, the textbook for the course is um, going to be a new edition of this book. This is the Algorithm Design Manual. I think it's a very good book. Okay, one reason is because I wrote it. Um, and uh, But this is in the uh, first edition, uh, which came out in like 1997. And um, the part that really is sort of the first half of the book, which is sort of the tutorial material that we would want to you know, use to learn the stuff that we're really going to cover in the class, is a little thinner in this book than I would like it. So I've been, um, I've spent uh, a lot of time coming up with a second edition of the book. And um, the topic for the course will be this manuscript, which is the printout of, which is a, a copy of the new first half of the algorithm design manual. Okay, it's about 200 pages longer than the previous first half. So there's more material, um, more deeper coverage of the material than in the original book. And I think it would be very good for people to be using the manuscript instead of using the full textbook. I think there's more material there that is relevant for you guys. And um, because this manuscript was just written, um, I Xeroxed copies. I have copies of, the, of them here, which I will sell to people after class at cost. It will be $11 each. Okay? I am not making a profit. Okay? If anyone thinks I'm making a profit, we can discuss it. And, uh, I am not, uh, but, but the main reason I, I Xerox it and I'm selling it to you directly is a convenience issue. With the departmental secretary not being here to handle the money, it seems like an easier thing to do it this way. So after class, I encourage everybody with $11 who's going to be taking this class to come by and buy a copy of the book. Any questions about that? Uh, yes, question. Uh, do you have to buy the book? I would recommend the book. Uh, but I mean, I recommend the ma this book, okay, the $11 book. Um, that's sort of the required text. Um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it, it, co it obviously follows my lectures as closely as any book that you can imagine since I wrote the book and I wrote the lectures. Um, the homework problems are also going to be drawn from so I do, I, you know, I do think that unless someone's got serious financial problems, they can pony up the eleven dollars and get the get the book. Okay. Any questions? Ah. So what is in the? There is stuff in the the real book that is not in 
the manuscript, okay? The truth is that the real book here has two parts, okay? There is a textbook material guide and that there is a reference guide. What you are getting in here is the textbook material guide, which is substantially expanded over this. This it was 150 pages, this it is 350 pages. Not so much that there's more material, but there is, I think, a much better coverage, a much more detailed and easy coverage of it. So I have zero doubt that this is a better thing for introductory algorithm students to pursue. If you want the second half of the book, okay, I encourage you to buy this, okay? This will cost you about $75 in the bookstore. If this really means something to you, you should get it. Um, if you object to buying this and this, uh, maybe buy this and maybe I'll throw one of these in free or something like that. If you buy, buy one at the bookstore or something like that. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about the book? So this, I think, I think that you will find this. I'm hoping you will find this a good book okay, to use in here. I think people have liked the old edition of the book. And I think for teaching purposes, I think this part of the book will be much better than before. Okay. But you guys are still going to, to find out. Any questions? So if you're saying you, you're taking this class because you want to study the PhD qualifiers, the answer is that the part that you need to know is in the first part of the book. Okay? If you want to go and you know um, look something up when you're in industry, you use the second part of the book. Okay? So um, you can worry about that then. Any questions? But that's why when you see sections in here that are pointing to sections that don't exist, the reason is they're sort of referring back to the second part of the book. But the, uh, the coverage of that is certainly not, that's sort of for, for deeper coverage, certainly not for the purposes of what we're doing up here. Any questions? Okay. Um, okay, so let's finish going through the syllabus. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the grading in here is going to be based on, I guess, five things. There is a uh, big problem that I'm going to assign. Okay, in fact, if you get one of the three handouts you should have gotten was this handout. This handout is the one that will say daily homework problems. And if you look at it, it is a date, okay, along with a problem number. And what I am saying is that I am going to start the, every lecture, every day as scheduled on the sheet, presenting the solution to a short algorithm problem covering basically what we did the, le the lecture before, okay? And, um, so what I want people to do is, every day, look at the problem of the day before class, write something on a sheet of paper, ideally stop thinking about the problem and solving it, okay? At the very least, thinking about the problem, okay? Turn in that paper before, at the beginning of class. I will then go through the problem of the day. And this is a, provides a way for you to, to, to make sure that the way you're thinking about this material is the right way to think about it, okay? To, to catch, see how I would think about solving these problems where the mistakes are, things like that, okay? So I, th I find that the people who do the problems of the day seriously do well in this class, and the people who don't do the problems of the day seriously don't. That actually seems to be the single biggest correlation I have found over the years between the numbers of problems of the day submitted and the actual midterm grades. They correlate perfectly, okay? So I encourage you to do that. Um, to encourage you to do that, the homework the problem of the days count for a total of 5% of your grade. Um, they will not be graded. So if you turn in something that says problem of the day with your name on it, that will count as much as a correct solution. Okay? Of course, it will not help you prepare for the uh, exams as well. But um, it's good to review the problem and think about it, even if you can't solve it right before class. Any questions about that? Okay. This is one thing I've, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a big believer in. Um, in addition, there will be three regular, uh, five regular homework assignments. These will, during the course of the semester, they count for a total of 15% of the grade. Um, you are allowed to work in teams of two people. In fact, you're encouraged to work in teams of two people on the homework assignments. Actually, for four of the five homework assignments, you're supposed to work with a partner. So I encourage you to find a partner, okay, who you want to work with on the homework assignments. This enables you to sort of discuss. A lot of the problems are tricky. It's good to have two heads working on them. If one person understands something, they can explain it to another person. Okay? You don't have to work in pairs. But in general, I believe that it is better if people work in pairs. 
Okay? So um, you, you will, there, there will be four of the problem assignments you will work in pairs. Um, there will be one other assignment, which is kind of an interesting assignment, which is the, um, when we get, at one point there will be a programming assignment where, where the goal will be to come up with the fastest program for solving a particular algorithm contest problem. We have a contest in here, a race, okay, and there will be prizes for the fastest solution and for the slowest solution, okay, but you don't want the slowest solution. Okay, that's just an initial tip off here. Any questions? So that, the, the race problem you'll work on individually. The other problem you'll work on, uh, two problems you should work in, 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 in with respect to a partner. Okay, any questions about partners or anything like that? Yes? If you're working, taking this with 587, you are supposed to be working with a partner. As far as I'm concerned, you are, you are a normal student, pretty essentially a normal student in the class, okay? So I, I, I would encourage you to, uh, to work on the uh, homeworks with partners, just like everybody else. Any questions? Okay. Um, then there is going to be um, two midterms in here, each of which is worth 25% of the grade, and one, and one final, which is 30% of the grade. Any questions about the grading? Okay. And how are we going to do that? Okay. Um, and again, I think I've described the... Uh, exams and, uh, and all. Um, what other rules would I give for people in the class? Again, I encourage people to get the textbook. Um, I encourage people to work with partners. One thing I will help do is if somebody cannot find a partner, I will help set them up with a partner, okay? But what I will not do is serve as a counselor if your partner doesn't work out very well, okay? So if your partner is a louse, doesn't do anything, is too stupid to work with you, I don't really want to know about it. Quietly break up with that partner after the next for, for the next homework assignment, and then find another partner. Okay, does that sound fair? And uh, you know, if somebody can't find a partner, come to me at the beginning of class. I will announce that there is a, a person looking for a partner, and we will find you someone to mate with. Okay. Any questions about that? About partners or how we're going to do it? Um, other policies that uh, that I. When you work as a part with a partner, you only turn in one homework between the two of you. Okay, so um, at the very least, there's less ink expended if you work in, in partners rather than pairs. Okay, the wrong way to work with a partner is to divide the problems up in half, and you do one half and he does the other half. The right thing to do is to sort of work together and think about it. Okay, any questions about that? Um, uh, what I people get into problems in, in the course of something bad happening to them during a semester, okay? Their dog dies or, or something happens, you get maybe a week, is, you're too overwhelmed with other things, and you may want an extension on one of the homeworks. I am giving everybody in this class one extension on one homework. You pick the homework, okay? You get an extension of one week for free, okay? The way that you get that extension is when you turn in the homework, you write down, this is late, this is my free extension, okay? Now, your dog cannot die twice during the course of the semester, okay? So, uh, so you, everybody gets one, one extension on one homework. Don't, um, you know, d don't ask me for a second one, okay? Any questions? Question. Now, people who are working as pairs, the, the homework has to be, uh, the, the homework itself is the thing that is late. So either both of them use the homework extension or neither of them use the homework extension, okay? So that's, there, there's no magic bullet there, okay? Any questions? Again, I encourage people to turn in the homeworks on time, okay? That's, that's actually the right way to do it. But I understand people get into problems, and uh, that's one way I handle that. Any questions? Okay? The other thing on the syllabus is um, there is some boilerplate about um, the, uh, what's it called? The... Um, you know, uh, cer certain other issues. Um, issues about, um, again, any cheating, I will, you know, deal with it the way that it, it's supposed to be dealt with, okay, and give an F and, and bring you up before the committee and all that kind of stuff. If you have any um, disabilities that I should know about, any learning disabilities or physical disabilities, you should let me know, and there's, again, standard ways of dealing with that, okay? Any questions about the logistics of the course? Okay. The other thing that I would say is the last item on the syllabus. Uh, 
is that I would like to establish as much personal interaction with people as I can. Um, it's actually, it doesn't look like it's that large a class this year, which is good. I hope that we will have a lot of interactions in class. And, um, you know, and, 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 and outside of class, if you have questions you want to ask me, you know, about algorithms or about life, I'm sort of available. I, I am hoping to have a pizza with, I like to have a pizza with the prof during the semester, where I, you know, get to have a sign-up sheet, people can come and have pizza with me at some point just to get to know some people. So uh, if I don't announce that within, let's say, three or four weeks, remind me of that. Okay? Any questions about um, courses, policy, or logistics, or anything like that? What? I buy the pizza, but that's why I limit it to 10 seats, so uh, I, don't, I don't go broke. Okay, any questions about pizza or algorithms or anything like that? Okay, the last thing that I would like, which I seem to have um, somehow, which I wanted to discuss, ah, uh, here I do have it, okay, is the uh, lecture schedule. So on one of the syllabus, the last page of the syllabus should be the lecture schedule. Um, the lecture schedule, the basic flow of the semester will be as follows. Um, one, um, we're going to spend, you know, the first three lectures on preliminaries, things like what are algorithms, why are they important, what makes them tricky. Um, we'll start talking about the mathematics of algorithm analysis, okay? There is some mathematics in this course, okay? There's the big O notation, which people have probably been exposed to. Kalir has, has never heard of the big O notation. Kalir has heard of the big O notation, okay? Everybody. Okay, how many people like the big O notation? A few people like it. How many people don't like it? A lot of people don't like it. Okay, so we're going to talk about that because it's a, a useful and important part of algorithm analysis. We'll try to get that down. And once you understand that, it's not hard to work with. So we'll talk about the mathematical preliminaries for the first three lectures or so. Um, we will review elementary data structures, okay, for the next week, for an, about a week, two or three classes on um, dictionaries and priority queues and things like that, which you've probably seen in some of your other classes, but are really the building blocks that more sophisticated algorithms are built from. Um, we will then d give a um, more careful presentation of the main sorting algorithm, okay, which you all have undoubtedly seen more than you want to see, things like quick sort and heap sort and merge sort. And um, we're going to go through that as examples of how you analyze you know, sophisticated algorithms, okay? Because I think there's interesting lessons in all of these sorting algorithms. And we will go through that um, in some detail. And that's where we will have the first midterm. Any questions about that? After the midterm, we will talk about graph algorithms. And um, there we'll talk about, you know, uh, again, depth first and breadth first search. We'll talk about the basic algorithms on graphs, like topological sort and con graph finding connected components and things like that. And the main, let's say, sophisticated algorithms, things like minimum spanning freeze and shortest paths, okay? And, um, you know, because graph algorithms are a very important part of the, the world. After that, we will talk about brute force search, backtracking and brute force search. How do you go through all configurations? Find the optimal configuration. Um, and that is where we will have our programming contest. It will be about a, br a, a brute force search program. Um, and we'll talk about backtracking um, in, in the search section. After that, we will spend three lectures on dynamic programming, which is a very important um, algorithm design uh, paradigm. That um, once you understand dynamic programming, it's amazingly useful and um, actually surprisingly easy to think about. Unfortunately, until you understand it, it looks hopeless. And so, um, Hopefully, over the course of three me the three lectures, we'll move from hopeless to understanding it, um, especially because after that is the midterm. We have to cover that material as well. Um, after the midterm, we're going to focus on um, this I these problems, basically, of intractability. Up till the fir through the first, second midterm, we'll talk about problems and finding and designing algorithms. Um, after the midterm, we're going to talk about problems which don't have efficient algorithms and how you actually can prove and argue that an algorithm, fast algorithm, does not exist for a problem. Which, if you think about it, is a really amazing thing. How do you prove that something doesn't exist, okay? You can often know that you, you don't have something. You could say, find an efficient algorithm for this, but you 
can't find an efficient algorithm. That just means maybe you're too stupid to find an efficient algorithm. But there's really ways of proving that, in fact, no efficient algorithm exists. And that's going to be covering the, um, the last part of the course. Okay, we'll talk about hard problems and um, how you prove they're hard and what you do about them. Okay? Any questions about that? And finally, we'll have a, a chance to find them. Any questions about the flow of the semester? Yes. The exams are, the final exam is cumulative, but the period between the midterms, each midterm will be uh, only discussed since the previous midterm. So the second midterm will not be cumulative. Okay. Although, of course, understanding stuff about sorting and data structures will help you graph algorithms. So a bad strategy would be to say, well, I'm not going to worry about the first midterm. I'm only going to worry about the material from for the second midterm, I'm going to forget everything I knew before the first midterm. That would be a bad strategy, but it's not going to be cumulative. Any questions? Any other questions, logistics, anything like that? Okay. Okay. So if this works now, I'd like to um, try to figure out how. Uh, let's let's see if we can figure out how um, to move on to my slides with all this technology. Okay. So um, first question is, what is an algorithm? Okay, I mean, we're taking a course on algorithms. Okay, um, if I think about what an algorithm is, okay, it is a, the idea behind a computer program. Okay, that, uh, you know, I have a hard time when I sit on a plane, okay, I, someone talks to me next to me, oh, what do you do? Oh, you're a professor of computer science. You must work on machines. You know how to work PCs. And as you'll see by my performance with the technology so far, I don't. Okay? You must build hardware. No, I don't. You must write software. No, I don't. Somehow what I work on are sort of the ideas behind the programs. Okay? That's really what an algorithm is. Okay? And um, one way I heard this, okay, that is interesting, is that an algorithm is the thing that stays the same about a program. When you change the language, when you change the uh, machine, and when you change the location of the machine. So an algorithm is a thing that stays the same when the program's in Pascal on a Cray in New York or BASIC on a Macintosh in Kathmandu. Question. These notes are available online. The um, new notes, which is what I'm suddenly getting a, a, a sinking feeling I don't have here, okay? Um, I, I prepared, I'm preparing new lecture slides along with the, the book. Um, those will be on the web page also. They're, they're not quite there yet. I'm thinking they're here when I turn the slides again. And I'm thinking that may be why they're badly formed. Any questions? Okay. So the, but the slides, the slides are in principle on the web. Any questions? So you think about what an algorithm is. There are a couple things that are important. One is that an algorithm has to solve a general problem. Okay. There's a difference between a problem and an instance. And this is a fundamental thing. Um, a problem. When I think about an algorithm problem, I mean a specification. I talk about what the inputs look like, okay, and what the outputs look like. That's what I mean by an algorithm problem. So what is an algorithm problem? Sorting is an algorithm problem, okay? Sorting is the problem of um, you're given as input a sequence of n numbers, and as your output, you want to permute the sequence so that the ith element of the sequence is bigger than all the ones before it and less than all the numbers after it, okay, or less than or equal to it. So when we talk about an algorithm problem, we are talking about something like this. Let's see if I can actually draw it. Look at it. Can I draw on that? Is that visible up there? Okay, good. So an algorithm problem is something like this. An algorithm instant, a problem instance, is something like this. A particular set of numbers is what I would call instance. Okay? A particular set of names to be sorted. The data is the instance. The problem is the description of what the input and output is. And the algorithm is something that takes anything that satisfies the input and produces something that satisfies the output requirement. Any questions here? Okay, um, and when we look at algorithms, what we want is we once we live in a world where we are given algorithm problems, what we seek are algorithms which are correct and efficient. Those are the two criteria 
that we are most mostly concerned with. Any questions? Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see if I can make this work. Hmm. Okay, anyone still believe that I work on tech software or technology? Um, okay, let's see if does anybody have any idea how to Okay, let's try this one. Is this going to be better? Um, I'm still right on it. That makes it feel better. Um, okay. For my next trick. Um, <laughs> okay, um, let's, let's, let's try this a couple more. Like, sorry, I'm sorry about this. Escape. Um. Okay, good. Is that readable or, or not as good as before? Zoom, can I zoom in the, uh, actually that's an interesting question. Probably not the answer. Okay, let's not play any more games here. Maybe we will play. Okay, um, let me try doing this. Okay. Sorry about this. Zoom to edit view full screen. That page. Okay, good. Can we move back and forth? Yes. Okay. So um, we were talking about algorithms, uh, and, and the issues in algorithms are correctness and efficiency. Um, what I mean by correctness is that for for when you have a correct algorithm. It means that for any input instance that satisfies the problem, that, that satisfies the input definition, it always produces the desired output. Okay, and um, one thing that we are going to see in here is that algorithm correctness is not always obvious. Okay, um, so it's sorting. If you have a correct sorting algorithm, there usually are cases that are difficult. Things like if the input is already sorted. Okay, if your algorithm is correct, it's got to be able to not crash if the input is already sorted. If the input consists of repeated elements, sorting 100 things, all of which are the same, okay, that's not allowed to crash either. It's got to leave it, you know, as it is. So we're going to deal with correctness in here, okay, and I'd like to give you an, um, an example of a, of a problem to show you that correctness is not a trivial matter, okay? And it has to do, let me give you a, a sort of a real world algorithm problem. It's a problem um, which is a problem actually I talk about solving in the book, um, where I was once visiting a company that makes VLSI testing equipment, okay? They have, um, you know, that you've probably, not VLSI, but printed circuit board testing equipment. If you open up an, a, you know, a piece of electronics, you'll see a printed circuit board on it, and parts are soldered into the board, okay? So has everybody seen something like that? Okay, so yeah, so that shouldn't be too alien. So th the company I was visiting was actually not so much soldering, but was verifying that the that circuit boards were correct. But let's think about soldering as the application. So you have a printed circuit board, okay, which is a, let's just see if we can get this to work, right? You have a printed circuit board, and on the back of it are a bunch of points, okay? 
places where you, the soldering iron has to go to, to cement the part into the, into the uh, board. And you've got a robot with a soldering gun, right? So the way that the, the machine that, that, that assembles the printed circuit board has to do is it has to solder every one of these contact points to assemble the board. Does that make sense or is that not clear? How many people don't see what I'm talking about? Okay, how many people do see what I'm talking about? Okay, everybody, so that's good. So suppose you are in charge of programming a robot and the robot's job is to visit all of the points in the board, okay? Soldering them, okay? What is the best order to solder it in? Okay, if you're, if you're let's say, you designed to program the robot, there are a bunch of different ways you could program the robot, right? You could program the robot to go here, to 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 here. What would make one ordering better than another? You really have to visit all the points, right? If the board isn't assembled properly. Does it matter which order you visit the, the, the points in? Someone with a hand. Okay, yes. Depends upon the cost. What would be the logical cost of something like this? Yes. What? Time. So if you think about it, you would like to, if you're, if you're assembling printed circuit boards, you hired the robot for a reason, okay? And the robot's job is to try to make these circuit boards as quickly as possible, right? So the robot has to spend some time moving the arm from here to there, 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 to there. Right? Does everybody agree with that? What would be the best tour? Okay? The one that would minimize the assembly time. Okay? In principle, it seems to me that if we assume that travel time is proportional to distance, which seems like a pretty reasonable assumption, right? Okay? If we assume that travel time is proportional to distance, then I claim that what you want is to find the tour that visits all the points in the minimum amount of distance. Does that seem like a reasonable problem? Okay, any questions about that? So, oh no, no, we'll see if we can do this right. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. So the shortest robot tour problem is given as input a set of points, okay? Find the ordering of those points such that you minimize the total distance traveled, okay? Any questions about what that problem is? Okay, I think the algorithm problem is clear. The input is a set of points in the plane. The output is the permutation that minimizes distance, okay? Can anyone give me an algorithm for this problem? Okay, can we suggest an algorithm? Back there, yes. So the shortest path algorithm, what does the shortest path algorithm mean? Okay, so you're giving me actually, uh, you're, you're referring to some higher authority or something like that, okay? Finite man or something like that. Can anyone give me an algorithm that you might be able to write a program for? Okay, yes. Isn't the Dijkstra's algorithm? Okay, so people are, are thinking, what about Dijkstra's algorithm? Dijkstra's algorithm, which we will review later in the course of the semester, solves a different problem. Dijkstra's algorithm solves the problem of finding the shortest point distance between two points. Okay? So if I want to know the shortest distance from here, let's take a here, you know, if, if let's say I'm given this graph, if I'm given this graph, and I want to find the shortest distance from here to here, following edges in the graph, Dijkstra's algorithm would be smart enough to do that. But it only gives you the shortest path between pairs of points, right? Not solving the same problem that we're interested in, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, any other ideas? Yes. Okay, so you're suggesting, I think, an algorithm like this. Let's see 
with your suggestion. Ah, let's see if I can figure this out. Okay, you're suggesting an algorithm like this. I think you're suggesting you start at one point. Okay, and you find which is the point that is closest to it. Does everybody agree with that? You're saying start from this point and find which point is closest to it. Okay, let's say this one. Okay, and then you find which point is closest to this. Is this the algorithm you're suggesting? Follow that way, follow that way. Doing the nearest neighbor tour. And lo and behold, you find the correct example, correct answer on that example. Okay, but does everybody see that one heuristic that we could use is the nearest neighbor tour? Start from one point, go to the nearest neighbor of that point, go from the nearest neighbor of that point to another point, and so on. Any questions about what the nearest neighbor algorithm is? Okay, what is the problem with the nearest neighbor algorithm? The problem is, if I can get this to work. Okay, let's try this thing here. Click. Problem is I can't work this. Um, ah, wait a second. Maybe this is. The problem is that the nearest neighbor tour is wrong. Okay, that algorithm is a wrong algorithm. It does not guarantee us the shortest tour on every set of points. Let's take an example here. If you look at my example, okay, here I have a set of points where, let's say the p point you picked was the point labeled zero. Okay, here, I'll try to go. Let's see if this is red. Does it like red? There we go. Okay. Suppose we start at the point named zero, and there happens to be a point one to the left and one to the right of it. Okay. Which one of those two is the nearest neighbor? Well, by moving one of them in a little bit, right, you can make either one of them the nearest neighbors. Do you agree with that? So let's say I made it so that this was the nearer neighbor. And now this is two points units from the, the other point, and two units from the other point there, right? Does everybody believe that I could make it so the next nearest neighbor of this point is going backward? Do people see that? OK. Certainly, if it's a tie, you don't know what to do, right? So you could pick either way, and you might go wrong. If you want to make it the heuristic, you move it in an epsilon closer, it's no longer a tie, right? There is a nearest neighbor, right? Does everybody see that what I'm going to do is jump over to this one? And because of how I laid out the points, the next ones are four units apart from each other. Does everybody see that if I put the points out in that way, the tour that the nearest neighbor heuristic might give me is this back and forth thing. Does everybody see that? Does everybody believe that that is longer than just going ka-chunk, ka-chunk? OK? I think it is obvious that that's a lot longer. How do I prove that to you? Well, look, um, there's always two, exactly two lines here. Two, you go over every point on the line twice with my optimal tour, right? Here you go over every point at least twice. OK? And in this case, up to n times, right? This tour can be vastly longer than that. Does everybody agree with that? So if your job was to program the robot for testing purposes, and management came by to watch it, and you gave it this circuit, I think management would be happy to see the robot bouncing back and forth, OK, on this simple example. OK? The nearest neighbor solution is wrong. Does everybody see that? Any questions about it? Any other ideas how we can solve the robot problem? Questions? Oh, ideas. OK, so what we're saying here is, that's an interesting idea. In fact, I get my, if I can figure out how to use my slide, oh wait. Got it. Okay. What you're talking about maybe would be called the closest neighbor tour. Okay. 
the, our idea is basically find the closest pair of points, connect them. Then find the next closest pair of points and connect them. Making sure you don't create something like this. That's right, green. Green, right? Does everybody agree that this would be a bad thing? I can't have a T junction, right? I can only connect each point to at most two places, right? So the question is, her idea is to always, the, the, for, for each pair of points, pick the pair that is, uh, that, it, that, that this would not create a cycle so far, or a vertex of degree three, something that won't make into a cycle. Keep connecting the closest thing until at the end you have no choice and then connect it into a cycle. That's basically your algorithm, correct? Does everybody see that uh, algorithm? Does it seem like a reasonable thing, okay? It's got to do at least as well as the other algorithm. Does. Well, no, it doesn't take it back, okay? Does it have to do at least as well as the other one? Certainly, if it happened that the points were on a line, it might do form a connected path, okay? But, but probably wouldn't. But the main thing to note is that this algorithm, what the property it shares with the other one is that it is wrong. And let me convince you of this, okay? Suppose, let's say, I gave you these points these are, um, it looks like I've got two sets of one, two, three, four, five points. Up there. Okay. I've got two sets of five points. Um, let's try any other color you want to see. I'll take this. Okay. Um, two sets of five points here. Okay. With the property that they are slightly closer together, the rows are slightly closer together than they are farther apart. Does everybody see what I've done here? This is going to be a distance of 1 minus epsilon, and that's a distance of 1. Okay? So what is your algorithm going to do? Is your algorithm going to go and say ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk? Okay? And now you're forced, you've run out of pairs of length 1 plus minus epsilon, right? Now you're going to try to connect them so you don't create a cycle. Well, there's not much you can do here. You know, there's a couple different things you can do, but the best thing you can hope to do is something like that before finally connecting them across. Does everybody agree that that's what your algorithm is basically going to do? Something like that. Okay? And does it clear that this one is longer than just connecting them in this nice rectangular box? Okay? This one's about 22%. Um, shorter than the other one, okay? So there's a sizable difference here, okay? Any questions about that? So your algorithm is also has the property that it is wrong, okay? It doesn't mean it's a smart algorithm, okay? It doesn't mean it's not a reasonable idea, okay? But it shows that correctness issues are not so obvious, okay? Any other ideas on how you can do it? Yes? Okay, not sure I understand what you're saying, but I can tell you it's wrong, okay? Let's just leave it at that. Okay, any other ideas? Anyone? Yes, question. Okay, so now here's one. Let's see if we can get this one right now. Boom. Boom. Boom, good, okay. So another idea that's a correct idea would be to say, can we do it with exhaustive search? So your idea says, that a solution represents a permutation of all the points. There are n points that are given to you, okay? Find an ordering of those points, okay? And test it, measure how long the tour is, correct? Okay, then try a different ordering of those points. If it is better, measure it. If it is worse, um, you know, ignore it, right? And if we go through, how many permutations of n points are there? How many different arrangements of n points are there? n factorial, to be precise. Okay, so if they had three points, there's three factorial, there's six possible orderings of the points. 
In fact, if you're a little bit clever, you could notice that we can always say that the first point in our tour is point one. Because every circular tour has to go to every point twice, right? So it doesn't really matter where we start, because we know we're going to end up there. But bottom line, by testing something like n factorial permutations of the points, okay, what's going to happen is one of them has to be the right one. Okay? And if we tried all of them, this algorithm is clearly correct. Does everybody agree with that? Is there any problem with this algorithm? It takes a long time, okay? How long does it take? Let's see if we can do this. It takes any longer than how for me to figure out how to use the projector. problem is exhausted search is a very slow algorithm. If you look at n factorial, how big n factorial gets, okay? Um, 3 factorial is 6. That's not so big, okay? But what is 10 factorial, okay? And if anybody's got, does anyone have a calculator with them which has such things? Okay? 3 factorial, I believe, 10 factorial, I believe, is about 3 million, okay? Which is not so unbelievably terrible a number. But 20 factorial is something like 3 million, is, 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 is a ridiculously large number, okay? So if you tried to write a program and solve it doing all permutations of 20 things, your program will not terminate in your lifetime or something like this, okay? So the problem is exhaustive search is very slow. And so we live in a world where right now we've had two ideas for what I will call heuristics programs that give you an answer to the problem, although not necessarily the right answer, that have the problem that they're reasonably fast. You could run them on thousands of points, okay, or hun millions, hundreds of thousands of points comfortably. We also have a correct algorithm with the property that um, it's too slow. And so now we're at the point, this is where ideally someone would come up with a fast algorithm that is correct, okay? And what's interesting is we will prove at the end of the course that for this particular problem, okay, there is no such fast algorithm for it, okay, or essentially making strong technical assumptions. There is no such correct algorithm for this problem, fast correct problem for this thing. It's something called the traveling salesman problem. Has anyone ever heard of the traveling salesman problem? Okay. Okay, so you know the name of it, but knowing the name of it won't help you. Okay, because again, there's no fast algorithm for this, okay? Any questions? So the moral here is that there are problems for which are well-defined problems, okay? There are obvious heuristics or ideas for heuristics, but a thing is a heuristic, a procedure is a heuristic unless you give a proof that is correct. And the idea that it's obviously correct is usually not a good enough proof, okay? Any questions about it? This, this, uh, uh, this may be an obvious point to people, but quite often when people work on a problem, a serious problem where the algorithmics are non-trivial, they will spend a lot of time thinking they have bugs in their program. Look, my program isn't giving the right answer. Maybe I have to change my program. It could be that your program is right in that it's implementing your algorithm correctly, but the algorithm itself just doesn't always give you the right answer. Okay, and what we're going to be talking about in here are how do you design algorithms that are fast and are correct. Any questions? Any questions about anything so far? Okay, let me see if I can do this. Okay, so one idea sometimes when people think that a pro their algorithm is too slow, okay, one idea is immediately to go try to buy a faster computer, okay? Stony Brook, I, I guess Stony Brook falls into this thinking a little bit. I guess I know you may have heard Stony Brook is buying a big supercomputer, one of the biggest computers in the world, and they're spending $25 million on this, okay? And it'll have thousands of processors, and it will compute lots of things incredibly quickly, okay? And I'm not saying the computer is a bad idea, but suppose you take this million-dollar computer or $25 million computer and put it to work solving traveling salesman problems by exhaustively searching, okay? 
The fact is it's something that takes exponential time, to n factorial time. Their supercomputer could probably search all examples of size 15 in a year, where your PC might solve all existence examples of size 12 in a year. Okay, that's not a big bang for your buck, right? Does everybody see that? Somehow we are, we are the real benefits when it comes to efficiency come in are when you can find algorithms that are really significantly faster than other algorithms. We'll see a lot of examples of that during the semester. Um, and the interesting thing is that a, a, a fast algorithm on a slow computer eventually beats a, um, fast, a, a slow algorithm on a fast computer. Okay? And usually it doesn't take a very large problem before the fast algorithms win. Okay? Any questions? If you really need to compute something fast, your dream world is a fast algorithm and a fast computer. Okay, and that's, I guess, why you buy one of these things. Any questions? Okay. So how are we going to describe algorithms in this class? Um, there's usually several, there's like three main ways that you can describe algorithms, okay? Um, and the way I think about it is an algorithm is a sequence of steps, a procedure for how you're going to solve something. There are three different ways that you can do this, okay, conventionally. One is you can describe an algorithm in English, okay, and describe what it's supposed to do by writing it down. Second, you could describe an algorithm by using pseudocode. What is pseudocode? I think of pseudocode as being a programming language which doesn't have a compiler, okay? It is sort of a way of describing it sort of like it's a program, but making up the language as you go along so that you convey the idea of the procedure as well as possible, okay? The third possibility is you could describe your algorithm by writing a real program in a real programming language. What is the advantage of doing something in a real programming language, okay? One is you could test it and run it, and that's useful. People will pay you for a program, right? So if you have a program. So in principle, writing something in a real programming language is good. What is bad about designing an algorithm in a real programming language? It's harder, okay? You have to specify all the painful details, because usually when you test your program, it doesn't work, right? So, um, so, so it's a lot more work to r implement an algorithm for real than it is to um, implement it in some kind of a pseudocode thing. What's an advantage of doing something in English? Okay, why, what, 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 what would be good about writing an algorithm in English? They can convince lay pairs. You say, in principle, it's easier to read and understand. Okay? And um, so the way I think about it is that these three methods from sort of English pseudocode to pro real programming language describe different levels of detail. Okay? And um, if you looked at the previous slides when I was describing the algorithm, I did have pseudocode for the algorithm, right? But I actually, when we were describing the heuristics to you, we were able to describe it in English clearly, okay? So the way I like to describe algorithms, and I think is, is in general the right way, is the ideas of the algorithm should be done in English, okay? And then um, if you, need, you go to pseudocode, typically if you have some details that are very tricky or intricate, that the English does not capture in a way that, that, that is interesting, okay? The worst thing to do that I hate students do a lot is when I ask to give an algorithm in class for a homework or something like that, immediately start writing in, in uh, a pseudocode that I can't understand, okay? The right thing to do is an algorithm remembers the idea behind a program. The first thing you should describe is what is your idea? What are you basically doing? So the way to probably describe homework, algorithm problems on homeworks or in general is to first write down what your idea is. I'm going to solve this by using brute force search, okay? And then maybe describe how you're actually doing the brute force search in more detail as you need it, okay? Any questions about that? In the pre first edition of my book, I described all the algorithms in English or in pseudocode. And one thing I dis you discover if you write pseudocode and you have lots of people read it is that your pseudocode is wrong. So um, one thing in the new edition of the book, um, most of the algorithms, I'll say maybe 50% of the algorithms are actually written, written as real programs that I've run and tested and that are available to you if you want to play around with. 
Okay, so um, so hopefully that will be clearer. One thing, you know, I'd be interested to hear from you guys is whether or not the um, the uh, um, you know how, how you how you like that. Any questions? Questions? They're written in C. My programs are written in C, which if you know Java, it looks like C. Okay, so it shouldn't be that much of a problem. I'm curious to see what people think about that. Okay, any questions? How many people here have, uh, can read C or write C comfortably? Most people. How many people feel they can't? No one who will admit to it. Okay, so that, that, that suggests that, that, that we're okay here. Any questions? Okay, good. Um, I do one other comment on the book while I'm here. Um, the book is, uh, again, I like the book. I wrote the book. Um, the uh, one thing that I would like people to do, I, I put it on the syllabus, but I forgot to discuss this then. Um, I encourage everybody when they're reading the book, if they find a mistake or something that isn't clear, to write that down on your book and um, show it to me at the end of the semester. I will give people extra credit here who submit to me a copy of my book with correction, okay? And um, so a good way to get extra credit in here would be, as described on the syllabus, find my mistakes and uh, correct them for me and give me your copy of the book afterwards. I'll, I'll replace it with a real copy, so it's not to get my $11 back or something like that. Because I'd like to get any feedback that you guys can give me. Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions? Okay. Fair enough. No, I would not prefer email. I would prefer a physical manuscript at the end given to me. Okay. And if you're afraid of parting with your book, you can prepare an email and send it to me at the end of the semester. That's what I would like to do. Any questions? Okay. Um, the, uh, okay, the other thing that when we talk about algorithms, again, we're specifying algorithms, um, we also have to specify problems, okay? And again, for an algorithm to work, okay, you need to be able, an algorithm only can be correct if the problem that you give it is well specified, okay? A lot of problems, I, I go work with people, I try to, to, to find algorithms for them they will come back with a very, very vague specification of their problem and say, find an algorithm to find the best score. As well as say, well, what is the best score? You know, one that doesn't have too many turns and one that doesn't take too much distance and one that passes by pretty scenery and stuff like that, okay? That is not a well-defined problem. Does everybody see what I mean by this? When you have multiple criteria, it's often hard to come up with a well-defined problem. If I ask for what the shortest tour is, that is a well-defined problem. It has a single answer, a well-defined answer. And so in principle, you can find it, okay? So part of specifying an algorithm is specifying your problem so that it's cor correct, okay? Any questions? Okay, let's see if we can do this again. Okay, so one thing about algorithm correctness, again, one thing I did in here that I think is an important skill to have, okay, and to try to develop, is the idea of learning how to demonstrate when an algorithm is incorrect, okay, because many of you are gonna come up with algorithms that are incorrect, okay? And um, thinking about, learning how to think about algorithms, so if you think about an algorithm, when is an algorithm correct? In principle, an algorithm is correct when you um, prove it's correct. Right? You give a rigorous mathematical proof of these things. And proving algorithms correct in a rigorous way is often hard. Okay? It's easy to fake, usually. Okay? You wave your hands and say, well, this is always happening in QED, and now the algorithm is correct. But one skill that it's very important for people to develop is the idea of trying to look for when is an algorithm incorrect. Okay? In principle, you guys suggested a couple of algorithms for our robot optimization problem. I was able to give you fairly simple examples where your algorithm was not correct. And learning to think about when your algorithm might not be correct is an important skill to develop. One of the sections in my book, I encourage you to read it, okay, goes through these kinds of techniques. But I'd like you just to think a little bit about it. Um, one thing that is a common way to prove your algorithms are incorrect Many of your algorithms, both of the algorithms you guys suggested for problems, involve 
picking the smallest or the best or the best next local move. Does everybody agree with that? Your algorithm, oh, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm pointing to now, said always go to the next closest point, okay? And you said pick the closest pair of points that isn't necessarily adjacent. You were proceeding in a particular order. And somehow what happens is sometimes when you proceed in a particular order, it gets stuck on something that isn't the right answer, okay? And it's good to know that when you design these kind of algorithms. Think about when an algorithm might be Okay, not be correct. So how can you come up with counterexamples, okay? The word counterexample is a great word. An example that proves that your thing isn't correct, okay? One technique that I, I encourage you to think about that's a very simple thing is to realize that whenever you have an algorithm that is always going to take the next best thing is that you could have a world where everything is the same distance apart, right? Points are on a circle. There could be lots of ties for what the next biggest thing is, okay? And sometimes picking the wrong thing. You know, if your program says, pick the next biggest thing, okay? And they're all the same size, okay? Your algorithm likely doesn't know what to do. Unless picking all of them is equal, it probably means something's wrong. Does everybody sort of see what I mean? Or this may be a little abstract. So one thing I urge you to be is to be critical of your own algorithm. Okay, when you make a proposal for something, think about why it might not work. Okay? One thing is to try it on all small examples. If you tried your TSP algorithm on a bunch of examples of four points, okay, or five points, you can probably break a lot of these kind of heuristics. Any questions about it? So we're going to think here about how do you demonstrate incorrectness of algorithms, as well as, no, let's see, um, bunk, bunk. Okay, let's try this. Uh, sorry about this. You guys will probably figure out how to do this. Sorry about this, guys. I will get better at this. I'm sure this is exciting to watch on the tape, right? Any questions? Okay, good. How do you prove that algorithms are correct? Okay. Um, the way that we will prove things, again, in general, we're not going to make this into a course on proving things, okay? But the one idea about proving things that turns out to be most important in algorithms is the idea of proving things by induction. How many here have proved, people here have proven things by induction? Okay, everybody obviously has, okay? Um, the way that you prove things by induction, okay, so when I first learned about induction, I felt it was a very strange way to prove things. Does everyone remember how you prove something by induction? You prove it for the case of n equals 1. Okay? You prove your program works on the empty input. You say, well, it works all the way up to a certain point. Okay? And then you prove it for the next point. Right? And this always seemed to me like a strange way to prove things. Okay? What about you're, all, you're, you're missing all the cases in between? Okay? Likewise, when I first learned about recursion, I thought recursion was a funny thing. Okay? How many people liked recursion the first time they saw it? Some people. How many people didn't like recursion? More people. Okay? Because recursion looks funny. You're solving your problem by what? By specifying what you do when n is 1 or so, the very small cases. And then solving the big problem by reducing it to smaller problems. And then magically, these smaller problems get solved. Right? So recursion seemed like magic. Induction seemed like magic. 
They're really the same magic, and this is something that once I realized, I, I suddenly felt I understood it, okay? So induction is gonna be a way that you prove um, recursive algorithms correct. Almost certainly, if you have a recursive algorithm, and many of the algorithms you're gonna see here are recursion, recursive, the way that you prove it is correct is by induction. And I'd like to do a quick, quick review of induction here, okay? Um, how do you prove, you probably know that the first, um, the sum of the first n integers is n times n plus one over two. I assume everybody's seen that expression before, right? Does that look foreign to anybody? How would you prove that this sum is equal to that by induction? What is the first step? Okay. n equals one, that's an easy step, one plus one plus one, that's two, divided by two is equal to one. The sum of the first one integers is one. Done, right? That's one third of an inductive proof. The next part of it is to assume that it's true for everything up to n, right? That this formula holds for up to n. One, two, three, four, up to n. And what's the last step in the inductive proof? works for n plus one. So how would we do that? What is the sum as i goes from one to n plus one of i? How do we manage to take this thing? We have to reduce it to something that we know the is true, okay? How do we reduce this sum back to something we know about? In terms of n, how do we make that happen? Yeah. Peel off the last term, right? This is n plus 1 plus the sum as i goes from 1 to n of i. Does everybody agree with that? And this, what is this equal to? This is the magic of our inductive assumption, right? We know what this is. So what is that? That is going to be n times n plus 1 divided by two, right? And now somehow we have to add n plus one to this thing, okay? And make it equal to what this expression would be at n plus one. What is this expression at n plus one? Okay? That would be sort of our target here. Would be n plus one times n plus two divided by two. Does everybody agree with that? How do we make this equal to that? Any ideas? What algebra? Okay, any ideas how to do the algebra? Flying blind here, you guys can, someone here can see it. Yes. What's my move? Okay, does anybody see a move? What? Factor out n plus one. And that's going to leave me with what? 1 plus n divided by 2. Is that what we get? Does this come to what we have here? Is this the same as that? How do we prove that? I don't see it yet. You can tell me. And then you can say maybe it's obvious. But I don't believe things are obvious yet. 1 equals 2 over 2. Oh. 2 over 2. And now what you're telling me is what? This is now n plus 1. This here is going to be, I see now, n plus 2 divided by 2. Does everybody see that? Now I think this is obvious. Okay, is this obvious to everybody now? Anyone who it's not obvious to? Okay. And so that's the basic style of an inductive proof. Okay. And what we're going to find is that we use inductive proofs fairly often in proving recursive algorithms are correct, okay? Any questions? And how does it work? We assume the algorithm is correct for small values, okay? We prove it is correct for all solutions or inputs of one element. And now we then prove that it works for all examples of size n plus one because it's recursively calling things that it works correctly on, okay? Any questions about that, okay? Any questions?
must be a deterministic device in some sense. Ah, wait, maybe it's right. Yeah, it's right. Any questions? Okay, fair enough. Any questions so far on algorithms or algorithms? Okay, um, nec for next class, what we're going to start to talk about, I think I'm going to, um, eh, maybe I'll give it another minute. I'm sorry about that. The next class, what we're going to talk about, or I think class and it goes till 510, is that right? Okay, so the next class, uh, what, what we're going to talk about here is now we've talked about how you design algorithms and how you prove them correct in some vague sense, okay? From now on, we're going to start to talk about analyzing efficiency algorithms, okay? And um, let me just get into the idea of this a little bit now to let you know what we are dealing with, because it's actually kind of amazing that we're going to be able to analyze algorithms in a way that is sort of machine independent, okay? This is a, sort of just an idea I want us to think about before I get into too much detail. In the olden days of algorithms, when people talked about how efficient an algorithm was, people said, well, I ran it on my computer for a week. That's how efficient it is. If I gave it this example on 100 points, it took a week. And that's not a, a good way to think about analyzing the efficiency of an algorithm. Why is it? Why would that be a bad way to do it? Well, first of all, if somebody gets a bad, faster computer, it no longer takes a week. Does everybody agree with that? So if you actually try to analyze algorithms in terms of running times or experimentally to try to determine the efficiency of it, you get our results that are not very meaningful, okay? Because as you change the machine or you change the programming language, the perceived time of the algorithm changes. Does everybody agree with that? Which is faster, C or Java? People say C, right? If I implement an algorithm in C, versus implementing it in Java. Is the algorithm faster or is the program faster? I think the program is faster. The algorithm is a thing that's somehow staying the same. Does everybody agree with that? So we can't analyze algorithms in a durable way by running them on real machines, okay? We can't analyze them in a durable way by looking very, very carefully at programs, okay? Because somehow the program in Java is going to be different than the program in C, okay? But somehow the timing analysis, in an ideal world, if the algorithm timing analysis is robust, we've got to have a way of doing it, okay? So that the um, analysis is durable, so that the um, analysis means something, be it if you wrote it in pseudocode or on a real machine or something like this. And the amazing thing is that there is a reliable way to think, talk about the efficiency of algorithms. And this gets us into our ideas of the big O notation and what we will call the RIM model of computation. Okay? Any questions about that? Next class, we're going to talk about that. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so for next class, I'll let you guys go, but I want two things from you. One is, for next class, I want you to do the problem of the day, okay? But in order to do the problem of the day, it looks like you need to have a copy of the book. Is that right? So I want people to come by and buy copies of the book. The books are $11 a pop, okay? And I encourage you all to come down and buy this kind of thing. Any questions? Thanks a lot. I'll see you guys next class, or hopefully up at the, at the cashier's window. Thank you. Okay, so if you have $11, I like exact change. And I'll autograph it at the end of the semester. Good. Okay, good. You have this. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Two fives. Two fives. Okay, I want to make sure you're, you're good. Okay, good. 21. You have 11. Okay, I like 11 better. But uh, you will get change. You will get change. Don't worry about it. Thank you very much. Good. 21. Okay. Is any, okay. Anyone have? Okay. You go here. 